When you're focused on the breath, you're focused where the mind and the body meet. It's through the breath that the mind is aware of the body, having a body. And it's through the breath that the mind exerts influence on the body and has the body move around. And right here is where the Buddha said that we do the work of the Four Noble Truths. Or in one formulation, this is where we find the world, the origination of the world, the cessation of the world, and the path to the cessation of the world. There's a sutta where a deva comes to see the Buddha and asks him, is it possible by traveling to reach the end of the universe, where there is no birth, aging, illness, death, or rebirth? And the Buddha says, no, it's not possible to reach there by traveling. And then the deva says, in a previous lifetime he had been a seer. His name was Rohitasa, and he was a skywalker. His stride was as far as the East Sea is from the West, East, of course, and West Seas, of course, being relative to India. And his speed was like a, an archer shooting a, a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree, in other words, very fast. And even with that speed and that stride, he decided to see if he could reach the end of the universe by traveling. And for a hundred years, aside from the time set aside for resting, eating, etc., he died before reaching the end. Then the Buddha went on to say, still, it's not possible to put an end to suffering without finding the end of the cosmos. And here it is, right here in the body. It treats the loka, which is either cosmos, world, universe, as equivalent to dukkha, suffering and stress. It's right here in this body, with its perception and intellect, that you can see these things. The world, of course, is the world of the senses. That's sensed right here. Sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, they all make contact right here. It's through the contact that we know about them. But we're not simply on the receiving end. The origination of the world, the Buddha said, lies inside as well. Remember his teaching that all phenomena are rooted in desire. That the origination of the aggregates, the origination of the sense spheres, is the, from the fact that we relish them and we welcome them. In other words, they're out there, but the fact that we relish them and go out and looking for them, want them, that's the origination of our experience of them. So it all comes from within the mind, right here. As for the path to the cessation of the world, of course, that's the meditation we're doing right now. There's a passage where the Buddha says, what one thing gives rise to four things, what four things fulfill seven things, and what seven things fulfill two things. The one thing is mindfulness of breathing, which basically comes down to filling the body with your awareness, being where the whole body is, you breathe in, breathe out with a sense of ease, rapture, on to equanimity, with well, the mind fully present right here, gladdened, concentrated, released. That kind of awareness is the path, and that fulfills the four establishings of mindfulness, the seven factors for awakening, and the seven factors for awakening when they're done with seclusion, in other words, the seclusion of concentration, dispassion, cessation, letting go, leads to clear knowledge and release. Now, from our point of view right now, the important thing is that all of this is rooted in full-body awareness, at ease. 
trying to develop a sense of the breath flowing unimpended throughout the body. I've heard some people say that the state of awareness is a state of awakening. It's not really. It's the path. This is as long as you're still aware of the, the six senses. You still haven't gotten to the, the cessation of the world. But it's through developing the path that you get there. You'll notice thoughts come up, and the mind, if you're not careful, loses its full, full body frame of reference and shrinks down to the size of the thought, gets inside the thought, and it goes up and down as the thought goes up and down. You have to remind yourself you have a place where you can step out just be aware of the whole body. You're not finding your pleasure in those small thoughts. You're finding your pleasure in something larger. As the Buddha said, this is a pleasant abiding. Even when the mind gets to equanimity, he said, this kind of equanimity is pleasant in a very subtle way. Because it's equanimity combined with knowledge, awareness. And so you develop this. Because that's the duty with regard to the path, is to be developed, so you get better and better at maintaining this full body awareness with a sense of ease. This is why we engage in directed thought and evaluation, to make sure that the mind settles down is not putting too much pressure on the body, not too little pressure on the body. And areas of tension, tightness can gradually be relaxed. So this is more and more a really pleasant place to be, a good place to step out. And you get a very clear sense that this is your home. This is where you want to settle in. There's still desire here, of course, the desire to stay. That counts as a form of craving, the craving that leads to suffering. So there's some stress in the path, but it's good. Craving for becoming, becoming a form, the sense of the body is felt from within. Or craving for the formless when you get into states of concentration that are more formless, with a sense of space, a sense of simple, simply being conscious of consciousness. So it is a type of becoming, and it is fabricated. And as long as it feels really good, the fact that it's fabricated doesn't bother you. But as you get more sensitive, there comes a point where you say, wouldn't it be better if there was something that was not fabricated? That's when the mind is beginning to get ready to move on. But again, it moves on in a way that you don't go someplace else. As the Buddha said, the cessation is touched right here at the body, seen with the body. In other words, the opening to that dimension is something that's going to be experienced right where you're experiencing the body right now. The difference being is not at the body and it's not someplace else. There's no location. None of the physical elements have a footing there. This relates to another story about the extent of the universe. There was a monk one time who was meditating and was able to gain vision of some devas. So he asked them, how far do the four great elements go, the elements of earth, water, wind, and fire? Where do they end? The devas say, we don't know, but there are devas who are higher than us. Maybe they know. So he meditates some more. He sees some devas that are higher up, and he asks them the same question. And they say, well, we don't know either. This goes on after many, many stages of being sent up the deva bureaucracy. And finally, some of the devas say, well, we don't know. But there is the great Brahma. 
and he will appear in a flash of light sometimes. So the monk meditates, and sure enough, the great Brahma appears in a flash of light together with his adoring retinue. And the monk asks him, how far do the four great elements go? And the great Brahma says, I am the great Brahma, knower of all, seer of all, creator of all that has been and will be. Now if this were the book of Job, the monk would have said, oh, I understand. But it's not. It's the Pali Canon. The monk says, well, that's not what I asked you. I didn't ask you about the great Brahma, the creator of all. I asked you, how far do the four elements go? And the great Brahma says, I'm the great Brahma, knower of all, seer of all, creator of all, etc., etc., three times. Then he finally pulls the monk aside. He says, look, I don't know. But if I admitted to that ignorance before my adoring retinue, they'd be very disappointed. You go down and ask the Buddha. So the monk goes down, asks the Buddha, and the Buddha gives a simile. He says it's like a land sighting crow. In those days when sailors went off into the ocean, they wanted to know they were near land, they would set loose a crow. And if the crow flew away and never came back, they figured, well, he found a place on land. They would know to go in that direction. But if he came back, it was a sign that there was no land in sight. And so the monk had gone, like the land sighting crow, to the east, the west, the north, the south. Didn't find any land, so I had to come back. Which, of course, is a simile for the answer that the Buddha is going to give. He said, you asked the wrong question. The question should be, where do the four great elements find no footing? And that's in consciousness without a surface. That consciousness, the consciousness of nirvana, where there is no awareness of any of the elements or any of the cosmos at all. The cosmos doesn't impinge on that, but it's the ultimate happiness. It's just something other, but it is to be found by fully inhabiting your body right here, right now, getting very clear about the perceptions in the body and the in intellect, what it's doing. And the perceptions and the intellect and the body, they all meet right here at the breath. So every time your thoughts go casting out for something else to get away from here, remind yourself, it's like that crow. There's really nothing out there of real substance. With all the images of these suttas, you can extend your thoughts out to the end of the universe and not reach an end, not reach satisfaction. But if you stay right here, you understand the universe and you understand how your engagement with the universe has arisen, and how you can find true happiness by putting an end to that engagement. It's all to be found right here.